So in this screencast, we're going to be looking at this example of the non-isothermal CSTR, which starts on page 2-31 of the notes. In this example, you have a material balance for the reactant A and also the energy balance for the reactor. <clears throat> now you've already seen part of this example, but I'm going to go through the whole thing. I'm going to go through A and B fairly quickly and then focus mostly on C and D. So first, to linearize, we're going to take the partial derivatives of the two right-hand sides of the equations with respect to both the concentration of A and also the temperature. By the right-hand sides, I mean I've defined them as functions F and G. So the partial of F with respect to the concentration of A is equal to minus D minus K0 e to the minus epsilon over t. Partial of f with respect to t is minus k0 e to the minus epsilon over t times the concentration of a times epsilon over t squared. Putting those two things together then the time derivative of the concentration of A is approximately equal to minus D plus K0 E to the minus epsilon over T bar times C A hat minus K0 C A hat sorry C A bar epsilon over T bar squared E to the minus epsilon over T bar times t hat. We can perform similar calculations for the partial derivatives of the function g. So the partial derivative of g with respect to the concentration of a is equal to beta k0 e to the minus epsilon over t. The partial derivative of g with respect to t is equal to minus d plus beta k0 ca e to the minus epsilon over t times epsilon over t squared, all minus alpha. Putting all those together, our time derivative of t hat is approximately equal to <clears throat> beta k0 e to the minus epsilon over t bar times c a hat minus the quantity d plus alpha minus beta k0 c a bar epsilon over t bar squared e to the minus epsilon over t bar all of that times t hat so those would be our two linearized equations then to put them in a matrix format first we define our vector of state variables and our state variables are c a hat and t hat there's supposed to be a hat on top of that t <clears throat> And when we put it in a matrix form like that, you get dy dt equals your Jacobian matrix J times y. And so the important part here is defining what is this Jacobian matrix J. So we have that J equaling to the first term would be the first derivative, or sorry, the derivative of f with respect to CA evaluated at steady state which would be minus d plus k0 e to the minus epsilon over t bar. The second term would be the derivative of f, f with respect to t, so minus k0 c a bar epsilon over t bar squared e to the minus epsilon over t bar. The next term is beta k0 e to the minus epsilon over t bar. And the final term is minus, in parentheses, d plus alpha minus beta k0 c a bar epsilon over t bar squared e to the minus epsilon over t bar. And so those are our four terms in our Jacobian matrix. So don't get intimidated by it. It's just a matrix with um, 
four terms in it. And each term happens to be a partial derivative, evaluated at steady state. Part C is asking us to find the steady states of the reactor. So if we set the equation for CA equal to zero, this is the full equation, not the linearized equation, then we get zero equals D times the feed concentration minus D plus K zero E to the minus epsilon over T times CA. Now we can solve for this for CA at steady state. CA is equal to at steady state D divided by the sum of D and the K zero E to the minus epsilon over T, all of that times the feed concentration. So what you see here is that at steady state, the outlet concentration equals the feed concentration times some factor which is less than one and related to the dilution rate as well as the rate that, um, the con that A is converted into B. And when we plug this expression for the con steady state concentration of A into the equation for T, or the energy balance, what we get and rearrange is we get this term, D times the feed temperature plus alpha times the coolant temperature plus beta K0 CA, where we will plug this into it, E to the minus epsilon over T, all of that minus D plus alpha all times T. So we rearrange that. On the left-hand side now, we'll put D plus alpha times T equals to the same first term plus beta times, now this is what um, I'm substituting in for CA, D times CAF K0 E to the minus epsilon over T all divided by D plus K0 E to the minus epsilon over T. <clears throat> now I'm going to do a little trick and well before I do that I'm going to note first that this here this is the heat removed by the coolant. This here is the heat added both by the feed stream coming in and also the heat conducted from the coolant to the reactor. <clears throat> and this term here is the heat generated. So this would be the heat removed, the heat added, I know it's weird to think of the coolant added, adding heat to the reactor, but that's what's happening. And also the heat generated by the reaction. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each one of these terms and I'm also going to divide everything through by D plus alpha. So I get T on the left-hand side and then all the other terms divided by D plus alpha on the right-hand side. So the first term is D TF plus alpha TC, all of that divided by D plus alpha. And the second term would be beta d caf all that divided by d plus alpha times this other fraction here k0 e to the minus epsilon over t all divided by d plus k0 e to the minus epsilon over t so that there is our equation it's a nonlinear equation in t and we're going to have to solve that for t using the values of the constants that i've given you at the top of the example problem to find what are the steady state values of T. And to do that, we're going to basically, what we're going to do is we're going to plot T versus T. And we're also going to plot versus T. We're going to plot this function here with these two terms. And when we do that, we get these two curves. Just plotting versus T is this green straight line here. And the other side is this curvy curve here in blue. And when those, when those two curves intersect, we get three different steady states. We get a lower steady state, a middle steady state, and an upper steady state. So just to restate that, it's important to understand this part. What we've done is we have an equation where we have T equals to, and then terms on the right-hand side. We plot a, a diagonal line T, and we also plot 
the, uh, the right-hand side of the equation versus t on the same plot, and when they're equal to each other, that is, where they intersect, those are our steady states. Now, I've chosen values in this problem so that they intersect three times. That doesn't always have to happen, but in this particular case, it does. And so we have three different possible steady states for our reactor. We have a low steady state, which also, if you plot the concentration of A on the same plot, you find out that this low steady state corresponds to a concentration of A very close to the feed concentration. So we have low convert, a poor conversion for the low steady state. We have a middle steady state, which has decent conversion, and it's at a decent temperature. So the conversion is about 33%. We have a high steady state also, which has very high conversion, but also it's at a dangerously high temperature. Part D asks us to evaluate the, steady, uh, the stability of these three steady states. And just from visual inspection, we can tell right away that the low steady state is stable, the high steady state is also stable, but the medium steady state is unstable. And the reason why we can do this is if I look at this curve, remember the green one, the green uh, curve is the heat removed, and the blue curve is the heat generated. And so, for example, if you're at the low steady state and you go slightly to the right, then your heat removed will be more than the heat generated. And so you'll tend to want to go back to the left. Whereas if you go off to the left, the heat generated will be more than the heat removed, and so your temperature will want to rise again. However, if you're in the middle steady state, if you go off to the right, then the heat generated will be more than the heat removed. And so that'll further exacerbate you going off to the right, and your temperature will continue to increase. Similarly, if you go off to the left, it'll exacerbate that way, and your temperature will continually decrease. The high steady state is in the same position as the low steady state. If you move away off to a higher temperature, you have more heat removed than generated, and so you move back. Similarly, if you move left away from this high steady state, you will also move back. So just from a visual inspection, we can see that those are the stabilities of the steady state. Now, when we plug the numbers into MATLAB and determine the eigenvalues of the Jacobian matrices for each steady state, we actually confirm that that's true. So for the low steady state, the eigenvalues are negative. For the medium steady state, you have one eigenvalue that's positive. So this one is unstable. And for the high steady state, you also have both negative eigenvalues, so this is stable. Now, notice here that I'm ignoring the, the imaginary part of our eigenvalues. And we haven't gotten to that yet, but the stability is determined by the real part anyway. And since the real parts of both eigenvalues for the low steady state are negative, that's stable. Similarly, the, the real part for both of the eigenvalues for the high steady state are negative, so it is also stable. And so the question that I leave you with is what does it mean that we have these complex eigenvalues? And so we'll see that when we do Laplace transforms.